Girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you are meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Well, welcome back to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important topic that's coming up and on the minds of all of us right now, and especially during this season, and that is coronavirus. What are we going to do about it? How can we uh, prevent it and prevent transmission and spread? And, and don't we want to just go on about our regular lives and have our regular relationships and, and hug and handshake and kiss? I mean, all those good things. I know I do. So, And I'm hearing from many of you that you do as well. Well, you guys know you can ask or tell me anything, no such thing as TMI. And if you go to my website at dranna.com, click on the show page, there is a space there for you to go ahead and ask me your question. You can tell I am in the pink hot seat, right? This is our hot seat. So this is where I'm taking a viewer question. And let's turn to our viewer right now. Who do we have on the line? Hi, Dr. Anna. This is Michael. You know, I'm really worried about uh, catching coronavirus during the holidays and especially around flu season now. Is there anything that you'd recommend taking to maybe reduce my risk of getting sick or, or trying to avoid getting coronavirus? That was a great question. And I know many of you may have the same question. And today we're going to dig in deep with two experts that I have. So let's get started. Here we go. everyone and welcome back. On the couch today, I have Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. He is from Dallas and has a long-standing history as an interventional cardiologist. He's now reformed and focuses on human performance and extending our lifespan to a healthy 120. A founder of the Gladden Longevity Institute and the podcast of Living Beyond 120. Living Beyond 120, right? It makes sense. So welcome, right. Jeff. Great to have Great. you here on the podcast. Nice to be here. Thank today. you. Yeah. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one thing that we want to talk about with our audience is how we are addressing coronavirus. What is the state of the union on coronavirus? What we know now. Sure. And we're filming this in, in late 2020, late November. And um, where are we at with this? Yeah, well, that's a, it's a great question. You know, we've, we've followed it all the way through, quite honestly. And we were, <clears throat> um, we're at a different point than we were, let's say, in March, for example. So where we are as a practice is we feel like we understand the, the virus, we understand how it propagates, we understand how to prevent it, we understand how to treat it, and we actually help uh, people recover if they, if they did get it also. So we feel really at this point in time, although you know, the rates of testing positive are going up, we actually feel less threatened by it now than we ever did. Um, so do you we, think it's because the virus mutated or is yes. it just, okay. Yeah. We think that the virus did not come from a market in Wuhan, China. We actually think that it was genetically engineered and there's a lot of, uh, we've, we've had virologists on our podcast, actually living beyond 120 that go through this in great detail, but it looks like really it was genetically engineered to be a super virulent virus, if you will. And now what happens in that situation is the viruses devolve, right? They, they don't maintain that hyper. Uh, toxicity, if you will, they devolve back to a more natural state, which is less toxic, still highly infectious, but many more people are getting infected, but many fewer people are dying. Part of that's due to the fact that we know how to treat it, but also I think the virus is also less virulent. I was wondering that looking at numbers just this week, it just yep. showed the death rate has dropped significantly. Exactly. And again, like you're exactly right. Definitely we know how to treat it better. Yep. And so let's talk about how it's propagated. Sure. So I think that, um, you know, close contact is really how it's propagated. Um, and, and we can argue, you know, the words touch or aerosol or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's close contact with other humans. You know, I think when I think about people and when I think about talking to the audience here, I think they need to understand, are you in a high risk group or not? Yeah. 
And are the people that you're visiting in a high risk group or not? You know, do, are you, do you have obesity? Do you have diabetes? Do you have a history of cancer? Do you have a history of heart disease, hypertension? Um, you know, do you have a history of asthma? Things like that, all Multiple those things. medication. Exactly, if you're a man, do you have prostate issues? Because that really increases the risk of infection for men. Um, so prostate issues, if you have non-blood type O, that seems to increase the risk as well. So first off, if you're, you need to understand if you're in a high risk group. If you are, then I think you need to take real precautions. Wear a mask wherever you go, wash your hands, maybe uh, more, we'd like to call it physical distancing than social distancing. Exactly, I'm with you on that. Right, because we want people to be socially connected. Yes. Um, but I think that if you do those things, you can be quite safe. And if you're gonna be visiting people like over the holidays who are high risk, then you need to take precautions with regards to their health. So we're big advocates of wearing the mask, washing the hands, maintaining some physical distancing and things like that in that, in that context. But also taking precautions before they go, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we also feel like that there are things you can do to monitor your status. For example, uh, you probably have gone into stores or restaurants and they take your temperature. So if you know your temperature every day, that's one thing. We all wear uh, body trackers, basically. This is a whoop band, there's aura rings, there's Apple watches, there's other things. Um, but what these are now doing is they're actually get, measuring your respiratory rate. And so at night where you're sleeping, you wake up and you can see what your respiratory rate was. Uh, because the virus attacks red blood cells and causes them to be disrupted, uh, oxygen carrying capacity goes down. The way you have to compensate for that is by pumping more blood and breathing faster. And so your respiratory rate can go up. We've actually had uh, a case in our practice where somebody's respiratory rate went up by about 30% based on this. Let's say normally it's running 14 or 15 and went up to like 20. It's like, let's go get tested. Sure enough, they were positive. So there's simple things you can do to monitor at home, just like respiratory rate. Um, the other thing you can do is, is get a pulse oximeter and look at your O2 saturation. You know, normally in, this, in, in Texas, it would be 98, 99% typically. Uh, but if you see it dropping, it could be another sign that you have the infection. So that's a simple thing you can do. Take your temperature, measure your respiratory rate. Uh, we like doing that to monitor. Yeah, yeah, I agree too. We have a pulse ox, uh, you know, yep. definitely a thermometer at home and that's yep. something to continue to watch yep. as well. And then other precautions are, preventive yeah. meth methods Absolutely. that you recommend for your patient. It's interesting that Corona, you know, it's both very infectious. And so you need to have your immune system be strong to deal with it. Um, we do a lot of genetic testing in our practice. And in our practice, we see that some people are very genetically predisposed to having this hyper-inflammatory response to the virus. And so we know that when we see that, that there are things that we can do to actually downregulate those genes. So we have a lot of our people taking something called special pro-resolving mediators. They're called SPMs. Uh, you can get these, uh, I believe you can get them on the internet now. Um, they're 250 times more potent than fish oil at resolving inflammation. And so it sort of keeps inflammation down. And then just from a, a purely sort of prophylactic standpoint, um, you know, there was talk originally that these viruses seem to crop up in areas of China that are low in selenium uh, in the soil. So we maintain adequate selenium levels by eating some Brazil nuts. Two Brazil nuts, yeah. 200 micrograms a day. Exactly. I, I'm pro yeah. Brazil nut. <laughs> yeah, so we like Brazil nuts. You know, three, four a week even is, is probably adequate for people. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing we like is we like zinc. Um, and you can take uh, a lozenge, a zinc lozenge, um, like Zycam. Do that even up to six times a day if you're traveling. Uh, vitamin C we like, 100 1,000 milligrams, maybe four times a day if you're traveling. 1,000 milligrams, mm -hmm. about four times a day while traveling. Exactly. Okay. Vitamin A is important, uh, about 5,000 milligrams a day, maybe not every day, but three, four times a week. Okay. You don't want to get too much vitamin A. And then we like vitamin D as well. Yes. So at least 5,000 units of vitamin D. Uh, we have a lot of people taking 10,000. There's a lot of genetic variation. How so people vitamin respond. D3 with K2 though, right? We love we vitamin D3 with K2. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we do. We use that all the time. 10,000 and 200 micrograms. I would say vitamin yeah. D says deposit calcium. Vitamin K says where, and that combination exactly. has been shown to also prevent calcifications yep. where we don't want them, like yeah, in the heart. Like in the coronary arteries. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. We use that. We use that continually. Yeah. And then there are other things that we like a lot. We like echinacea, uh, especially combined with elderberry. Uh, and those have been around for centuries, for yes. millennia, right? Yep. As a, as a um, 
integrative option or a holistic natural remedy. So um, is elderberry tea? What about elderberry tea? And elderberry tea is tea? good. Yeah, echinacea is really, I think, kind of one of the best things you can do. And speaking of tea, EGCG, that comes in green, green tea, tea, is super healthy for you as well. It downregulates uh, inflammation. I have that in my formula, Mighty Maca, combination of superfoods. So it has that green right. tea, quercetin, turmeric, resveratrol, yep. all of these other. One of the other things that's been shown to be very helpful is uh, curcumin. Yeah. So uh, we like that. And, and using brands like UltraCure uh, or TheraCure, where you have very high bioavailability of the curcumin. And I think Thrive is, is another band, brand too. Okay, Thrive, yeah. And then just making like a turmeric milk, like we call it gold, uh, golden milk, mm -hmm. like making a hot tea with turmeric and almond milk or coconut milk or you know, being able, another natural way to get it in. Yep. What do you think? No, I think, I think, I think that's good. And, and, you know, eating it, as you know, it's poorly absorbed, right? So it actually, uh, it has to be combined with something else to get it into your system. Typically a pepper, right? Uh, well, pepper will work, but there are other more sophisticated techniques. So like combining it with a whey protein actually gets it right in. That's what UltraCure does. And oh, TheraCure okay. does is a, uh, a different combination that actually gets it right in. So you can get much higher levels with those then you can just taking or eating curcumin, right? That sounds good. Yeah, so we, li we like all those things. And uh, curcumin too, just a potent anti-inflammatory, good for joint pain, great for athletes, health. brain health, yep. memory. Yep, cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. There's a couple other things we really like. We like something called arteriosil. Um, you probably haven't heard of arteriosil. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a cardiologist by background. Um, your arteries- well, Let's stop on that, Rick, because this is a really interesting history because you as a cardiologist, you did interventional cardiology. Right. That's like end stage. Okay. I'm coming in with a heart attack. I'm coming in with symptoms. That's right. You've got hard, you've got some blockage and we're going to go in That's right. and clean that up. And now you're on the entire, the opposite end That's of right. that spectrum. Yep. Talk about that for a minute, because this is so profound. This is what we know can happen. These diagnoses of heart disease and diabetes aren't, you know, aren't for life, right? It's not a death sentence anymore. We know there's a lot we can do to Absolutely. reverse this process and yep. really remove those diagnoses. Well, you know, my situation was that I practiced interventional cardiology here in, in North Texas and Southeast Oklahoma for 25 years. And I built my own heart group. We had 10 offices, 12 doctors. We flew around in a little A36 Bonanza. I set up cath labs at multiple hospitals. I actually co-founded the heart hospital up in Plano uh, with David Brown and Gary Brock out of Baylor. Uh, which was a great project. Um, but when I got sick in my 50s um, and was told, hey, uh, everything checks out, uh, you're just getting older, uh, it really flipped a switch for me. And I realized that I've been practicing sick care and not health care, and that we really only get the answers to the questions that we're asking. And I was asking, how are you feeling? Are you having chest pain? Are you having shortness of breath? Are you having palpitations? If not, you're okay. Then you're well, right? And so- Not I symptomatic yet. Exactly. So I threw myself into functional medicine, age management medicine, integrative medicine, and over two and a half years, cracked the code for myself as to what was going on. And I started to feel really great again, instead of feeling like I wasn't going to be able to keep up, keep up with my kids. So at that point, I basically said, hmm, I've been asking the wrong questions. I'm going to ask a different question. I'm going to ask, how good can we be? How fit, how strong, how mentally sharp, and for how many years and decades can you carry this forward? And that's basically morphed into the practice that we have today, um, and then asking bigger questions. How do we make 100 to new 30? How do we live well beyond 120? How do we really crack the code on aging? And so in our practice, we are going down multiple avenues to really, we're super passionate about cracking that code. So that's what we do. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm an interventionist, um, but I'm intervening to, to really keep people very super healthy, if you will. To reverse the disease. Exactly. And we do, we get a lot of people off their medications. We see arteries improve. We see plaque disappear. Uh, we see, you know, cardiovascular performance improve, lung performance, brain performance. I mean, we could stay here all day. Actually, We could talk about, about I know, and I can, yeah. we can talk stories because my father was suffering with heart disease at 79 and his yeah. cardiology said, to me, Dr. Ant, you know, he said, Anna, you, your father's lived a good life. Right. What is and, that all about? And so needless to say, I said, well, do you mind if I intervene? And I did. And yeah. needless, and let me tell you, he lived to 91 good, good for you. years. Exactly. 91 yeah. good years. And, and that so, for us is a young person now. That's a young person, right? right? And to live well with your brain intact exactly. and 
being able to travel and go places. I mean, it really is. And we yeah. want to protect that because too many good, good people have died too young. Absolutely. So let's shift back to coronavirus. So okay. I have you for a couple more minutes. And I want to hit on, um, you were talking about artemisil. Yes, arteriosil. Uh, arteriosil protects your arteries, so the virus can't get into the arteries, and that's really helpful. Another one we like is something called Avmacol Extra, which is sulforaphane with uh, glycans from uh, mushrooms, basically. And when you put that together, the sulforaphane blocks the virus from getting into your respiratory cells. So we like those a lot for prevention. And the other thing is that if you're going into, uh, if you are a high risk person and you're going to be around your family or you're going to travel or whatever it is, taking some hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin prophylactically will block the virus being able to get into your cells. So we recommend that as well. Um, and if I'm going to go into a high risk situation, I'll take that as well. So. So, but how often can you take that? So I've been hesitant unless, you know, to recommend it or use it unless I, you know, there find are, a high need, high risk patient yep. and a high risk situation or early symptoms. Yep. We treat early symptoms with it all the time. I also have other people that are traveling internationally and we've been giving it to them prophylactically. Now, if they have a cardiac condition called a prolonged QT syndrome, which you've heard about, which can increase the risk of arrhythmia and those drugs can lengthen the QT a little bit further, which increases the risk. Uh, then you have to be a little bit careful. So we, but we're measuring all that for our clients, right? So we understand where they're at. That being said, uh, we think that that combination works amazingly well. And certainly if you have the earliest signs of symptoms, jumping on that right away will definitely shorten the course. So we, we love that. We use the SPMs. We also love a, uh, something called molecular hydrogen that basically downregulates all of your, um, all of your inflammatory and oxidative stress related to inflammation. So through supplementation or through uh, using? You can, you, can, you can go online, there's H2 Max, uh, which is a product we actually developed. You can find it on Amazon um, and molecular hydrogen is great. We use it as athletes also. So. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, to increase oxygenation and? No, it's actually, it's actually to balance, it's, think of it as an adaptogen. I know you okay. like the adrenal gland, right? So I you, do. Right, so that's all about balance, right? Um, and stress, and we'll talk about stress in a second. But um, what H2 does is it balances the whole redox system, okay? You need some reactive oxygen species. If you blunt them all, you know, you've stopped all the signaling. Antioxidants have never made anybody live longer, right? There's no study that's ever shown that antioxidants make people live longer. Yeah. That's not the answer. But balancing the oxidative stress is key, and the hydrogen does that. Well, we need, we need stress, right? As an we athlete, do. you know that we, we need stress. You need exercise. Well, no, I think I've had enough stress right, right now. Well, that's but... a different kind of stress. <laughs> that's right. And I think to your point, there's been a ton of stress related to uh, COVID. You know, people, families disrupted, jobs disrupted, et cetera, et cetera, depression, all these kinds of things. Massive toll. I think even bigger than the virus. Um, and so we've really kind of doubled down on meditation and exercise and things like that to yes. gain perspective and you know, keep everything in focus and, and decrease the stress. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's so much more we could be talking about, right? There's exactly. so much more. We're going to do another hard episode with you for sure. Sure. So I want to thank you for your time. If there was just I'm one pleasure. thing you would want your clients to take, so just say a um, uh, 50-year-old with early symptoms, uh, with uh, let's just say 50-year-old with diabetes and um aching joints and pain. So we see the inflammatory issues, insulin resistance issues. What's like, what's, a, if they would only be able to take one thing, what would you say? Okay, we have to take this one thing. Well, are, do they have symptoms? Is that what you? No symptoms, no. Oh, okay. Preventatively. Um, that's really tough because I, I really think that this is a multifaceted thing. And I think you can't really limit it to just one thing. I, I think we do okay. them a disservice to say one thing. Quite so honestly. give us three. Well, I think, I think, Personally, I think the Avmacol is great. I think the, uh, the Echinacea with elderberry is critical. I think the zinc is critical. I also think the vitamin D is critical, the vitamin C. I just- Okay, this, I, we're good. That's, exactly. I mean, absolutely. You, you that's really need a number of things. Yeah. I agree. And I think for me too, it's that, that foundational support is number one, stop all sugar, right? Get keto yeah. green, oh, do what we sure. can there. Yeah. And, um, and really take control of that. So I think we're on that. We're on, definitely on the same page. And the supplements you recommended, we'll put those in the show notes as sure. well, so our audience has those as reference and can yeah. can uh, 
can look those up as well. But I'm with you foundationally. D, we hear this all the time. D, C, zinc, omegas. And mm -hmm. looking at, of course, we're with our Mighty Maca Plus and just looking at these, uh, you know, the constellation of areas that we have to address. It's never just one thing. It's never just one thing. Yeah. Thank you so Good. much, Jeffrey. Thanks for being with us My today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Great to have you here. And to our audience, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden, he's here in Dallas, the Gladden Longevity Institute. And you can look him up, Jeffrey Gladden, MD. And I look forward to seeing you in just a minute. We will be right back. Welcome back to the show. We are gonna continue this discussion of coronavirus and with me on the couch virtually right now is Dr. Anjali Aki. She is a dear friend of mine and we've known each other for over a decade. And let me tell you, one of the most intelligent, inspiring, oh. heart-centered, amazing women that I have ever been blessed to meet and definitely a dear friend of mine. So um, welcome, welcome Dr. Anjali Aki. Welcome to the set, how are you? I'm doing great, Dr. Anna. It's always a pleasure to be with you teaching. I think that's what we're doing today. <laughs> yeah, we're teaching, having a conversation, and want to really provide solutions and um, dissipate the fear. Well, one thing we know now is that really it seems like the coronavirus, we know how to manage it better and um, less, less people are dying who get it, right? less sick yes. and our critical stages are better managed. And so wanting to dissipate some of the fear around this and to um, you know, restore confidence and also talk about the cutting edge therapies, what's going on right now. If we do, if we become, if for someone we love becomes really, really sick, I and mean, this is where we want to take notes, what's the science showing? And of course, with your integrative medicine, your internal medicine, your uh, tremendous, uh, background and studied at Yale, created Yale Integrative Medicine, right? I mean, all of these things that you've done and so up on the research, plus in clinical practice and treating patients in your own practice. So that's why I want to have this conversation with you today and with our audience to inspire them and give them real solutions. Okay, this is what we know to be true at this moment. Sure. And it's an evolving topic. Um, mostly I spend my days managing outpatient medicine patients, our uh, cumulative population is about 6,000 in North Central Florida, and I was happy to have rapid COVID swabs. So what happens on a day-to-day -day basis are people call in having symptoms or having been exposed, and then we manage them through it such that only one person has uh, died out of our practice since March, and she was an 88-year-old woman with chronic lung disease called interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. So she was at risk of having severe complications should she, ha she have received COVID, which she did and she passed. But overall, really happy with my team's effort at keeping our population super healthy. Let's talk about the stages of coronavirus and what we should do at each stage. Yes, I shared with you uh, figure three from a guidebook that we put together, but basically there's four Phases to Wait one second, just to stop on that. That guidebook is called Kick COVID to the Curb and is the book that everyone needs to have, right? You talk, really have a good understanding about coronavirus in general, as well as COVID-19 and how it's affecting us, plus what to do about it. And so that will put show notes to the link to get Kick COVID to the Curb, your excellent resource that you and you. Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith wrote. I will say Harvard and Yale together, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with a, a good integrative perspective. So yeah, so the stages, we'll put up that slide. Yeah, uh, that's published in May, and yet we're still using it every single day with our patient populations and those who uh, tune in through our webinars because it's still accurate and any updates that have happened have been placed on our website, uh, firemupdoctors.com. So I'd refer you to that. There's over 130 references there as well. But going back to the phases of COVID-19 disease progression and severity, there's four phases. The first phase is exposure. Somebody coughed on you. Usually you have symptoms. It could be fever, chills, cold symptoms, diarrhea. Isolated diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting, four to 5% of the time could be gastroenterological only. So that's uh, phase two where you have symptoms. Usually again happens two to five days after exposure. 
And it could be simply cold symptoms, or it could be simply gastroenterological symptoms or a combination. So I always like to know what day of the disease process you're in so that I can predict where you might take a turn. Usually phase three starts to happen, which is the early lung phase about day 10 or 11. I consider this, if you're gonna take a turn for the worse, I call it the cliff, where at least in our practice, we offer to see you every single day, including Saturday and Sunday, to make sure that the oxygen levels aren't going lower, that your lungs aren't getting inflamed, uh, or you're having shortness of breath, because this is when you start having shortness of breath. And I always taught my population that way back in March to have three instruments for monitoring on hand, a, a good thermometer, a good blood pressure cuff, and something called a pulse oximeter that measures the oxygen level in your blood. I get really concerned when the oxygen level, which is normally 99 to 100%, when it drops to 94% or lower, we start moving because we, we are concerned that you're moving into the early lung phase. And that's when we have to monitor you really, really closely. When you desaturate towards 91%, we actually are moving you into the emergency room for chest x-rays, blood thinners, if it's appropriate um, treatment, inpatient hospitalization. Usually when you're in phase three, uh, early lung phase, or uh, you put, have potential to the valley of death. When your lungs fill up with cement, pus, and blood clots, it literally feels like you're breathing against cement, and it's very dangerous at that point. And that's where, you know, if we do have a chance to talk about clinical trials, that I'm uh, Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith and I are in the midst of designing clinical trials. Uh, to prevent progression from phase two to phase three with some progressive therapies I can't really talk about, but it's in the regenerative medicine world. Um, and there are, it, it, there are published studies in regenerative medicine of over 94 clinical trials in regenerative medicine at clinicaltrials.gov. So that I will tell you. But that really trying to segregate who will in the early, who will progress to early lung phase and then who is at risk to moving to the late lung phase where they're really a danger of multi-organ system failure failure not only of the lungs but the heart gets affected about 30 percent of the time and the kidneys because of the doorknobs into the body called the ace2 receptors which are the doorknobs that uh, covid19 virus also known as sars cov2 enters into the tissue and so that's how we think of it when you're in the hospital at least at my local hospital and we've had really great success um, except that one older lady. When you're in phase three, you're being monitored very closely. Uh, if the oxygen starts dropping, you get remdesivir. And I had a 35-year-old morbidly obese woman, 35-year-old teacher, she's morbidly obese uh, still, she had lost 40 pounds prior intentionally, but she was still over 200. 35 years old, went into the um, early lung phase, oxygen drops to the low 90s, she said she felt like the remdesivir didn't really help her, but within one dose of convalescent plasma, which is antibodies donated from someone who has survived COVID successfully, she said that within one dose of that, she started to feel a shift that her body started getting better. So she was quite miraculous. So from the time of admission to discharge, it was seven days. And so I think that we get you through the process. And again, we've managed over 50. Uh, COVID patients, some more severe than others, about eight to 10 hospitalized and discharged. And about of those, about five have what's being defined as post-COVID syndrome, which is a topic we could spend some time on if you want. Really um, important. So in talking about like the treatment once they get in the hospital, right? Because we're doing all the intervention. We're working, I'll say we're getting keto green, we're avoiding sugar, we're getting on uh, healthy levels of vitamin C, D, zinc, selenium, uh, our omega-3s and any additional supplements. We just had Jeffrey Gladden on and we talked about some different, different and um, uh, novel also alternative supplementation that we can take as well. And then looking that once, you know, if the, we progress from phase two to phase three and looking at hospitalization, that what about IV vitamin C therapies and IV, you know, multivitamin therapies and, um, 
we talked about prone positioning and low pressure oxygenation as well, right? Yeah, so a couple things once you're in the hospital. And I think a really good source, I know that University of Vermont, a hospital in Seattle, and uh, University, I believe, of West Virginia have progressive therapies that include intravenous vitamin C. So at my hospital, I've tried really hard to convince them to use intravenous vitamin C. It's been unsuccessful. I don't think there's any downside. In my own personal practice, in phase one, phase two, and post-COVID post recovery, I'm using a lot of intravenous nutritional therapy. But um, I'm working with my hospitalist colleagues at my local hospital, trying very hard with all the literature to convince them to use intravenous vitamin C, but unsuccessfully, despite uh, the major academic centers, again, University of Vermont, uh, University of, I believe, of West Virginia that are using intravenous vitamin C protocols. Talk about so, post-COVID syndrome now too, because this, pro, you know, this, um, it seems to be lasting for months, doing well and then doing you know, having respiratory issues again. What are, what are you seeing? What's, and what do we do about it? How do we help patients going, experiencing this, who've had this kind of prodromal or prolonged recovery time period? Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting about COVID is that we as physicians are going back to our roots and observation. And I don't think until we pull data and observational data, including uh, artificial intent, intelligence that will really totally understand this. But what's interesting about the long haulers syndrome, which is actually post-dromal, um, prolonged symptoms, is that uh, it's been the people that have been affected that have gotten together on social media and compared notes that have been so useful. But if you read the literature, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association published an article about a month ago, uh, they're still trying to make a definition of what it is, but it looks like at three months after COVID, three out of four people still have symptoms. Those symptoms can include chest pains, muscle aches, inability to exercise, sleep disturbance, brain fog, um, and shortness of breath. And what does that really mean? We're not really, the biomarkers or labs can be totally normal or they could be abnormal. Uh, in the clinical trial I'm helping to design, we're actually trying to figure out what biomarkers we could use, what labs we could use at baseline, propose a very progressive intervention in the field of regenerative medicine and define our cohort and then see how they do. So that's an active process. If anyone has any ideas, uh, Dr. O'Neill Smith and I are actually trying to design that this week. Um, but I really like the collaboration and collegiality between multiple specialties, mul academic, clinical, outpatient like myself, inpatient just to beat this virus or to kick COVID-19 to the curb. So number one, I'd refer you to the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association article that published last week on long hauler syndrome, which is a post-COVID syndrome. So other people have actually recommended the definition happen at six months of still having symptoms. But the closest, disease state that it resembles at this point is a condition called chronic fatigue syndrome. And you could get chronic fatigue syndrome from SARS-1, right? The first thing, SARS-CoV-1 led to chronic fatigue syndrome. Also Lyme disease, also mono or Epstein-Barr virus. And so um, if you think that you are a long hauler or post COVID syndrome, I'd be more than happy for you to reach out to me through the information at Dr. Anna's website, because we will be enrolling uh, for this clinical trial on, uh, for, to treat post COVID syndrome. I think it's gonna be a humongous public health issue as it gets more defined. I have no interest myself in getting COVID because I do not want to get post-COVID syndrome. So with so, post-COVID syndrome, what can people do now? Uh, well, because we think it has an inflammatory component um, and we really don't know, I'll tell you what I'm doing. 
uh, but I'm still collecting data to see if it's helpful. And I think it, it may be, but we're still defining it. Um, get a lot of sleep. If you're tired, rest. If you have exercise intolerance, which most of my patients tell me they can't exercise well, make sure your doctor checks an echocardiogram of the heart, make sure your heart's okay. Uh, and some pulmonary function tests, make sure the lungs are okay. So get checked out. Eat an anti-inflammatory. I love keto green because honestly, Dr. Ann, it looks like a fascial syndrome. And I love fascia too, because we recently published a, a medical textbook on fascia where the body's inflamed and it hurts and it's intolerant to a lot of exercise. So your keto green 16, alkalinizing the pH, even in the fascia, especially in the fascia is so important as is staying very well hydrated with a balanced electrolyte solution a non-sugary one, staying well hydrated, getting enough sleep. You've already discussed the nutritional therapies, but an additional one, if you haven't discussed, is glutathione, the grandmother antioxidant. It's located in the crucifers, um, uh, crucifers vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. You could take it supplementally. I gave a webinar on that about we gave a webinar on that a couple months ago, but look up how to get glutathione in your diet. It's essentially the rainbow of colors, omega-3 fats, that's fish oils, which I believe we've already talked about. So without knowing exactly what the syndrome represents from a tissue standpoint, from a pathophysiological standpoint, it's hard to say at this point what is going what is effective to treat because it's so it's relatively new but at least in my patient population those are the those are the uh, ways that i'm trying to help my patients recover uh, if they're suffering from post-covid syndrome i think that's a the excellent advice angelie thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and i know you go into even some regenerative medicine and kick covid to the curb so talk about peptides and stem cells and what we can do with these other interventions that are up and coming to help, especially I think in this like post COVID syndrome. Um, and I, you know, there's so much that we're, we're just looking at right now as we kind of recreate, get on our feet again and, and get back out into the world and, and continue to help others. And you've been on the front line seeing patients, um, right? Not saying no to anyone and treating all the COVID patients that came your way and diagnosing and taking care of them and staying healthy and keeping your staff healthy while you've done it. So I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to thank put you. this show in the show notes uh, where we can connect with you because we definitely know you're in clinical practice in Gainesville, Florida, seeing patients on the front lines and, and have this excellent resource, Kick COVID to the Curb. So we'll put the links to your website. And I thank you so much for being here with us today. You know, I love you. I can't wait to have a glass of wine with you. <laughs> so I'll catch up with Same you soon. Dr. All right, be All right. well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Coronavirus is a serious topic, and I'm glad we had our experts on today to really dive into what can we do to prevent getting it? How do we decrease the spread of it, right? And, and keep others healthy as well as ourselves healthy. And also, what do we do in the stages? You'll see some overlap in the recommendations, and certainly what you need to know to do is to embrace, embrace what is so important to you, those connections around family and nourish your body. One of our pillars is to nourish nourish and support our immune system, our body and our health. And that comes in many levels, certainly through that good night's sleep, through good relationships, through great connections, right? And, and vitamins and supplements. I supplement on a regular basis and we'll put in the show notes too what I'm taking as well. But I want you to know that we at this time, at this higher stress time, we need a little extra because we can't get it all in diet um, alone. So nourishing our body becomes very important, not to mention nourishing our mind and nourishing our relationships. So with uh, our experts, Dr. Gladden and, and Dr. Aiki, as they've talked also about what to do if we do get sick, right? If we do or someone else gets sick, there are cutting edge therapies that we can, that we can take part in and also to not give up. Right? We're conquering, conquering this illness. And the more we do together and staying healthy, the better off we're all going to be. So thank you for being here with me on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I look forward to seeing you next time. 